Hello. Hi. This is Elizabeth Davis with the League of Women Voters of Portland, and you are watching the Video Voters Guide. We, in conjunction with Metro East Community Media, are here speaking with candidates running in the May 2020 primary election. With me today is Mike Schmidt, running for District Attorney, Multnomah County. Welcome, Mike. Hi, Elizabeth. Hey. Let's uh, jump right in with the first question. Uh, please tell us a little about yourself and why you're running for this office. Uh, so about me, my background, my first job, I was a high school teacher uh, down in New Orleans in the public schools where I learned, I went to learn about the education system and learned a lot about the criminal justice system. Uh, as my students were uh, involved as, as victims, witnesses, and sometimes children of incarcerated parents. I went to law school here in Portland, Lewis and Clark, uh, graduated and decided I'd get involved in the criminal justice system and got a job at the Multnomah County District Attorney's Office where I prosecuted for about five years. Uh, and I did great work there. I felt really good about it, uh, but ultimately I didn't feel like I was changing the system. Uh, so I decided to get out and work on policy. And for the last six years, I've been uh, working at the Criminal Justice Commission, which is a state agency focused on criminal justice reform. I've been the director for over five years now. And we've had all kinds of major criminal justice reform projects, looking at how we can keep our community safe, but make investments into things that we know reduce recidivism, like treatment, housing, drug courts, things of that nature. Uh, so when I saw the opportunity to run for district attorney in Multnomah County, taking both that I've been a prosecutor and have headed up an agency at the statewide level for the last six years, uh, and have been focused on how to improve our criminal justice system with data and research, I felt like this was just a really fantastic opportunity to take all of the skills and the connections and the networks that I've made and bring it to Multnomah County. Great. Uh, let's jump into the next question. So what role does Multnomah County DA have in reducing racial bias and disparities in our criminal justice system? The DA can, can have a huge role. Um, if you take it as more of a passive job where district attorneys just read the police reports that come to them and then make charges or not, there's really not much of a role there. But if your DA really wants to look at the, the data and who's coming into their system and make charging decisions that are based on what's happening in the community, but with an eye towards why are we seeing disparity come into our criminal justice system? Quick example, at the commission that I had, we looked at possession of controlled substance as a crime, which means possessing a small amount of drugs. Uh, we looked at the data and there's wild disparity, even in Oregon, for who gets arrested and charged with those crimes. But we know from decades of data that people of all races and, ethnic and ethnicities use drugs at the same rates. So that's an example of a place where a DA could say, I know that the crime is being committed in our community at the same rate, but the re police reports that I'm getting are reflecting uh, disparate uh, arrest and charging decisions. What can I as the DA do about that? And that's where you can get into diversion programs and partner with community groups to try to get people outside of the criminal justice system and into things like treatment that will help them actually deal with the underlying issues. Okay, uh, thanks for the answer. So under what circumstances would you consider charging a juvenile offender as an adult? Yeah, so I was part of and, and really proud of the legislative uh, effort to pass Senate Bill 1008 in this last session. Um, Senator Jackie Winters, who passed, that got to be one of the last things that she saw happen, which essentially took juveniles out of being automatically charged as adults underneath Measure 11. So now it is up to the district attorney to make that argument to the judge. You know, I think the criteria that I would use in terms of making that decision is, first of all, I'm going to err on the side of treating kids like kids. We know the research and the science says that the human brain is not fully even developed until about 25 years of age. So I'm going to err on the side of treating juveniles like juveniles and going through the criminal justice system on the juvenile side rather than into adult court. But every once in a while, there could be a very egregious crime that juveniles are involved in. There was one up in St. John's where a juvenile shot a man uh, in the chest with a, with a shotgun and, and he ended up dying. You know, those are the type of cases where we're going to look at the public safety uh, to make sure that, you know, first and foremost, we're keeping the community safe. Uh, and if that requires in that type of a situation, a longer sentence, um, then, you know, I would look at uh, those type of cases for potentially asking a judge to, to waive that person into adult court. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, uh, so the next question, we've got two left. So please discuss the issues related to pretrial detention and any recommendations you have for reform, including bail. Yeah, 
So I was the first candidate in this race to come out and say, we need to eliminate cash bail. Uh, ultimately, cash bail fails on keeping our community safe on two ways. One, it keeps poor people in just because they don't have money, not because they're dangerous and not because they're not likely to show back up into our criminal justice system, but just because they don't have $500. That's just fundamentally inequitable. And certain communities we know have been economically, socioeconomically disadvantaged by policies uh, from our government for, for decades. So we're, we're treating certain communities differently when we use cash bail. But on the other side of things, every once in a while, somebody is truly uh, should be held due to public safety. But they have the money to bail out and they're able to bail out. In Washington state, a man who hadn't had the means uh, was charged with domestic violence crimes the judge set bail as high as he could, and the man still posted it, bailed out, and ended up murdering his wife tragically at the end of last year. So cash bail fails public safety on both sides. It keeps people in that don't need to be in, and it lets people out who should be in. So ultimately, I think we need to let judges just decide, first of all, do you need to be held in to keep the community safe? And two, if, if we release you, will you show up again? If the judge is satisfied with those two answers and we invest in some pretrial um, services, Simple things like just sending people text message reminders that they have court today uh, have been shown to dramatically improve the rate at which people show up into our courthouses. So I think there are some simple things that we can do to, to make sure people are showing up and get rid of punishing people just because they don't have the means. All right, last question. What role does the DA have in addressing societal problems that contribute to criminal behavior? I think the DA can play a really large role in that. Um, you know, one of the things, one of the reasons that I'm running for this office is because I see a need for the, the district attorney to step out of just the, the prosecutorial lane. We're thinking that the solution to every problem is another prosecution. I think we should build coalitions with the health agency, the education system, the foster care system. A quick example, my work at the statewide level uh, we help pilot a program and fund a program called Family Sentencing Alternative Program. And what this does is this targets parents in our community who are in the criminal justice system. And instead of sending them to prison, where by their, the sentencing laws they would be going, if they have dependent children, we put wraparound resources into uh, working with them so that they can stay in the family unit. What we've seen is that when we've done that, recidivism rates, which is the rate to commit another crime, have decreased by 17% as compared to the people that we send to prison. So we get much better results. And we have estimated now that we have saved over 350 children from going into the foster care system by investing in this program. So I think the district attorney can look at all of these different systems and build partnerships with our education system, healthcare system, foster care system, and think about the impacts that our, our decision to prosecute crimes have on, on our entire society and not just in the narrow lane of how a prosecutor views things. Okay, great. Well, thank you for your time. We're out of time. This has been the Video Voters Guide. Thank you for watching. The election is Tuesday, May 19th, 2020. Be sure to inform yourself about candidates and the ballot measure and exercise your right to vote.